I'm Aoife Moore. I am a political correspondent with the Irish Examiner based here in Dublin, actually in Leinster House, along with uh, Brendan and Rose. I'm originally from Derry City, um, what's known as a ceasefire baby now. So I remember before the Good Friday Agreement, but spent most of my life um, after the Good Friday Agreement. So instead of me um, butchering their reputations, I'm just going to let each person <laughs> introduce themselves. Um, and just want to thank Lord Barwell for your speech there. We're going to start with Rose, if you want to go first. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Eva, And thanks to Glenn Cree and Barbara and Eve for, for being here this evening. I'm Rose Conway Walsh. I'm the TD from Mayo, Sinn Féin TD from Mayo. And, and it really kind of struck me um, in, in what was, when, what Gavin was saying there in terms of identity politics, because I suppose I'm a, a, a class case of that and that I was born in London, my father was born in London, came back to Ireland, lived in London for a long time. Half my family are in London and half are here. So I think it's kind of indicative what an awful lot of, there's 100 and, 103,000 British people living on the island here and the exchanges between the two. So, you know, what is identity and how do we describe it? I think is a very interesting question. But thanks, Eva. So, um, my name's Linda Irvine, and I suppose identity resonates very much with me because I'm from the, the Loyalist community, but I run an Irish language centre. And really, when you, you spoke, something that really resonated with me was the idea of being British and Irish, because I am both British and Irish, and I don't know why anybody in Northern Ireland would deny their Irishness, because when you do that, you say you're a usurper, you say you don't belong, and I do belong. I'm a native of Ireland, so I'm Irish and I belong here. Brendan? Yeah, I'm Brendan Smith of Fianna Fáil TD for Cavan Monaghan. I've been a TD since 1992 and served in government in the past and at present and co-chair of the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly and obviously representing two of the southern Ulster border counties. I've had always a huge interest in, in the need for us to have stability, peace on our island because I see it on a daily basis and I see the value of the Good Friday Agreement. It has been, despite where we are today, it has been transformative for the better. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Conor Houston. Uh, I'm a member of the Social Democratic and Labour Party in Northern Ireland, the SDLP, and uh, I stood in the Assembly elections, which happened just 10 days ago, and unfortunately uh, was pipped at the post and didn't win uh, the seat in the Strangford constituency where I ran. Uh, but I have had a role uh, as a lawyer in Northern Ireland and also carried out a number of civic roles, including being uh, governor of the Irish Times Trust. Um, and uh, I've been very involved in uh, British-Irish relations and in relationships across this island. And I suppose, picking up on the theme of identity, I have a slightly strange accent because whilst I was born uh, just outside of Belfast in a little village called Hollywood, I grew, spent my childhood growing up in Surrey in the south of England. And in 1996, when I moved back to Belfast, went to a Catholic school there with a very thick English Surrey accent. <laughs> and for those of you who are Dairy Girl fans, <laughs> I was the original wee English fella <laughs> who came to a school in 1996, hadn't a clue about anything to do with Northern Ireland, Irish politics, and in many ways, the last 25 years has been uh, a baptism of fire trying to make sense of this wonderful place and the place that I'm proud to call home. All right, thank you. Um, I just wanted to start um, not on Brexit, if we can help it, even though today, I think of all days, we couldn't have picked a better day um, to be here and have these discussions. The thing that um, really resonates with me with Glenn Cree is, you know, the notion of peace and reconciliation. And we're having this conversation in the midst of a debate or an argument or whatever you want to call it about legacy and amnesty um, for the conflict. And I just wanted to get your kind of, you be the most experienced or barbell of, you know, the kind of mindset that you think is going on within the Conservative government at the minute about the amnesty, about what they think it's going to achieve. And we know it's very hard to unite all the parties in Northern Ireland, but they've managed it mm. <laughs> because it is deeply unpopular with, with, every, <laughs> with every party and with, we know, the government um, in the Republic as well. So what do you think is, is the mindset behind that? 
Um, first up, please call me Gavin. Okay. Um, the, the only person I try and get to call me Lord Bull is my brother, and his reply is not, <laughs> is not repeatable in polite company. Um, so, look, I think the, 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 the driving force for it is a sort of emotional sense of unfairness of British service personnel who've been through several processes already being potentially brought back another time. And I'm, I'm sure everyone knows Johnny Mercer, uh, uh, ex-member of the armed services, has campaigned very, very powerfully on this. It was something we dealt with when I was in Number 10. Um, Gavin Williamson, the then Defence Secretary, tried very hard to get Theresa to adopt this policy. And she was very clear, and the, and the Conservative manifesto in 2017 had been very clear that we didn't believe in amnesties. Um, but if you're asking me why do I think they've got to the position they have, that's the kind of emotional force that has, that has driven them there. I, I don't think this is a thing where the British government can provide the answer. I think that the, the answers have to come on this island. There are, you can think of other, con uh, sorry, you can think of other conflicts where there has been some kind of truth and reconciliation process and then you draw a line, but that isn't the decision that the parties had reached. Uh, and I think, as you say, it should be a warning sign to the government that the, all of the parties in Northern Ireland are speaking with one voice on this issue. Mm -hmm. And Linda, just like from your, you said you come from a, a loyalist background. In terms of things, you know, like amnesty and the kind of amnesty that they're talking about, in your community and the people that you're speaking to, is this something, like, I personally have never met anyone who supports this. But I just wondered, in your community, is it something you think people would be willing to do? Is it something you think is worthwhile? I, I can't speak on behalf of my community, but I can certainly speak on, um, you know, on behalf of myself. And I have to be honest, you know, when I have went through certain communities, loyalist communities, and I see banners up that say, we support Soldier F, I'd feel nothing but shame, absolute shame. Because, you know, if somebody did something, if somebody committed a crime and they shot somebody who, you know, was unarmed, who was an innocent victim, then of course they should stand trial. And, you know, I've heard people using the excuse, oh, well, you know, we released people with a Good Friday Agreement. Yes, we did, but we tried them first mm -hmm. and then we released them. But these people, what we did with them was we said, you didn't do anything wrong. In fact, you see the people you murdered, they did something wrong. So I think they need to go to court and maybe after the court case, we will release them. Mm -hmm. But they have to stand trial because it's for the respect for the victims mm -hmm. to know, you know, my relation was murdered. Mm -hmm. My relation, what happened to them was wrong. They didn't do anything wrong. So, mm -hmm. you know, I feel quite emotional about this because as somebody from the Protestant community, it does not represent me. I hate those banners and I don't want to see those banners. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to see an amnesty, mm -hmm. no. And Brendan, like you were in, um, not to give away your age, but you've been in <laughs> no, quite a long time. A and when years. around, you know, we're around the Good Friday Agreement and the release of prisoners was very contentious at the time. You know, the notion that we would be releasing people and we've seen now um, Fianna Fáil especially very strongly against the amnesty. And do you think, you know, it is the same type of thing, the same theme, the kind of emotion of it? Like, can you even buy into the argument that we have released people, so maybe we shouldn't be trying people? No, as Linda said, different scene altogether. The amnesty proposals are reprehensible. The half-baked proposals we listened to today are equally reprehensible, I think. I hadn't the opportunity to listen to much of the detail. But what's happening is the victims, it's not victim-centred. It's actually what what I heard about today was perpetrator centered. The perpetrators will decide if I'll go forward and tell my story. That will be equal beneficial to the murderers from the paramilitary organizations and to the murderers from the state forces. So here we could have a buy-in from two conflicting sides if what the, the short, the small bit of detail and listening to it today. So I think what's announced today is not good enough either. There has to be a judicial process. I know families that have campaigned for decades and decades. They're not out for vengeance. They don't even want to see, in some instances, people put into jail. They want to get the truth. Mm -hmm. So here, the proposals that were announced by Mr. Johnson and some members of his government would say to those, vict those victims and families of victims and to people who've been advocacy and representative groups, your work for decades, forget about it. There's, mm -hmm. going to, there's, never, 
going to be a chance of getting the truth. A lot of these families know very, very well, and they accept that it's going to be very hard to get the truth, never mind get a conviction. But the idea of stopping it and saying that people who carry it out more, be it on behalf of a state or be it on behalf of a paramilitary organisation, under no circumstances should they have an amnesty of any sort. Mm -hmm. And just on that, you know, these are really contentious kind of issues and you feel sometimes that, you know, for all the, the for all the relationships that we've built and the time has moved on, we're getting more and more polarised. And I just wanted um, to turn to you in terms of, we talked about the election last week and we saw, you know, it was a, a great day out for Sinn Féin and a great day out um, for the Alliance and then less so for the DUP and yourselves. Do you yourself think that the North is becoming more polarised or what do you put down to, you know, it's not even, Sinn Féin didn't gain any votes, but they consolidated very much the, their vote and they are now the biggest party. Do you put that down to polarisation? Do you put that down to your party, maybe, I don't know, having a bit of an identity crisis or the na nationalist people moving towards Sinn Féin or Alliance? What do you kind of put that down to? Big question, <laughs> and uh, still feeling a bit sore having <laughs> not, not won my seat. But um, you know, I, I just just to, on the last point, I, I'm a criminal defence lawyer was my my first career, and so I represented people across the spectrum, from armed forces to paramilitaries uh, to victims groups and families. And just to really echo what what Brandon said, uh, every one of them uh, was united in one thing: they wanted truth and that acknowledgement and for uh, a fair judicial process to take place. So I completely agree if we're going to achieve reconciliation, um, that, 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 is, that is essential. Um, to answer the question about the election, um, yes, I mean, I suppose the, the first thing is, I, I'm not sure I'd agree that, that we've become more polarized. I think what you had was a consolidation uh, around uh, if you're the DUP, Sinn Féin and uh, Alliance. I think there was very much uh, a sense within the nationalist Republican community that this was a historic election around seeing Sinn Féin take the first minister's position, albeit that it is a joint office. And as the old adage go, one can't order a paperclip without the consent of the other. But nevertheless, there was, and it's, it's undeniable, a symbolism in uh, Sinn Féin um, t topping the poll, as it were. And I have to say, being on the doorsteps, uh, albeit there was a small national Republican uh, community in my constituency, there was certainly that feedback that people wanted to send a message to the DUP. Mm -hmm. There was an anger within even moderate nationalism, who would probably traditionally have supported the SDLP, saying we want to send a message to the DUP, mm -hmm. and the way they wanted to do that was to support Sinn, Sinn Féin. I also think it's important to acknowledge that I think Sinn Féin ran a very effective campaign um, in, in this election. The, the DUP was, was really, I think, quite lucky to sustain the number of seats that they did given mm -hmm. sort of miscalculations and I have to say I was because there was a lot of anger on the doorsteps towards the DUP so I'm surprised they did nearly as well as they did I think they were lucky that whilst the TUV got uh, traditional unionist voice got a lot of votes it didn't actually affect their, yeah, sure. their, their seats and then you had this I think what happened was people who wanted to reject as it were the green and orange politics felt that the only place to go in this election was the alliance and they were helped also I mean they have had a surge for a number of years but I think they were also rose and I was talking about a, a, an opinion poll which came out a number of days before the election mm -hmm. which suggested that they might come in equal to the DUP and I think that spurred a lot of people mm -hmm. in the middle again people who may have voted SDLP or UUP mm -hmm. to, to go to Alliance First Preference. Mm -hmm. um, my party, um, it was a very difficult uh, election for us. We lost four seats and a lot of conflicts myself didn't, didn't get elected. We suffered from both sides, from the Sinn Féin uh, support and also from the surge towards Alliance. And you, I think, as a political party, we have work to do now to become relevant, to make uh, the position of the Social Democratic and Labour Party relevant again mm -hmm. in Northern Irish politics, what it means to be a Social Democrat, uh, being a party that's committed to reconciliation, being a party that's committed to building a, a truly reconciled society and uh, in, in a non-sectarian society and, and becoming relevant again, I think is going to be the big mm -hmm. challenge for the SDLP uh, going forward. 
And Rose, um, in terms of your party, you know, every poll, every election, it, it very much seems like you are unstoppable, you know, at this stage in Ireland and south of the border. In terms of the election um, that we just had in the north, you know, what's Shen, do you see the future now of the North as Sinn Féin and Alliance? Do you think that's ultimately where they're going? Do you think it, it will be the nationalist party or, or nationalist community or Sinn Féin voting community and a more centre-ground type party? Do you think that's where the, the North's headed? Well, Aoife, you know, a week is a long time in politics, so <laughs> I certainly wouldn't take anything for granted. I think... Uh, what Connor was saying there, I think the thing that really, I suppose, brought people out, we were concerned. We were concerned coming up to the election in the last time we had, particularly in five seaters, where we had uh, the third seat. You know, would we be able to, we had the crocodile moment the last time. And I think, again, it was presented this time by the DUP in not uh, saying beforehand, and indeed the UUP to a lesser extent, um, that they wouldn't serve under if, if there were to be a nationalist first minister. And I think that galvanized, um, as Conor was saying there, people behind Sinn Féin in the sense that nobody likes somebody who, who you know, doesn't believe in democracy or we'll only buy into democracy if we're going to come out, if we're guaranteed to come out the winners. So I think in one sense that that led the election, but also I think we did, we did a, an intelligent campaign um, we let the DUP do what they do best, mm -hmm. walk into a, a, a tunnel. And they did it again, and they continue to do it. Um, you know, you could almost say at this stage they advocate Irish unity because <laughs> they go in that direction, all the time, whether it be supporting Brexit. And I hear what you're saying, Gavin, in terms of you know, the last people who should have voted for Brexit, knowing that there would have to be a border somewhere, um, would, be, uh, would, be, would be the unionists in the north. Just getting back to the original question, I think all of that could be avoided. Everybody did unite around the command paper or against the command paper and what was in that. The fact that families cannot even, aren't even allowed an inquest I think is just major and it really resonates with people. Lots of the families and the, the, the victims, um, the families of the victims would, don't necessarily want the same thing in terms of court cases and, and all of that. But I think they do want the truth and I sat in on the Belly Murphy inquiry and that was very telling to feel the pain and the, the hurt in the, in the room there. So I think, but I think if the Stormont House Agreement was implemented, indeed if the Good Friday Agreement and the subsequent agreements were implemented fully, then uh, a lot of the problems, even post-Brexit, uh, would be solved. I think it's the lack of the implementation that really is coming home to roost now. And where does that responsibility lie? Of course there's a collective responsibility, but as co-guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement, the Irish government and the British government who kind of thought, or well, the absence of war means peace and reconciliation. And we know that that doesn't. And I suppose as somebody who comes from the west of Ireland, why peace and reconcil real reconciliation is so important to me is, I have seen and witnessed the destruction of the absence of reconciliation after the Civil War, where you're hugely economically disadvantaged and all that, because people vote on the basis of their identity, whether they're Fianna Fáil or they're Fine Gael. And that what was different coming up to the last election here, is that people were willing to break away from that. But it took decades, and my wish is that the North won't take, it's certainly that it won't take decades, and that's why we need to treat this with an urgency, both the British government, the Irish government, all of us, um, and, and indeed civic society as well and the American administration, obviously, and the EU. I think everybody has a role to play in that. We don't want a situation where people are just defined by their identity or aren't secure enough in themselves <coughs> in their own identity as human beings to be able to make decisions around economic policies and social policies and, and, and other policies. And that's, I know that's gone a bit off the track, yes. but... Uh, um, in terms of the election, yes, it was a good election for us, but we have five elections, I think, coming up in the next five years. Different elections will throw up different things. Um, I think we all have a responsibility to work together um, to reshape our island. And we might agree, disagree on how we get there, but I think we... Uh, 
we <laughs> agree on a lot more. Yeah, because yeah. even in this election, I've noticed, you know, when I was growing up um, in, in Derry, that I, there was only two, like I come from the nationalist community, so there was only two parties you could vote for. You voted for Sinn Féin or you voted for the SDLP. You didn't vote for anyone else. I don't even think a lot of any other parties stood in near where my estate is. And you said earlier, Gavin, that you felt a bit politically homeless, you know, at the minute about, you know, the direction the Conservative Party and stuff's going on. I just want to come back to you on this, Linda, in the last election, you know, you're going to, and like, as we keep, I think a lot of the time we talk about unionism as this monolith, as if they all believe the same thing and all of this. So your story is quite different and it's really inspiring in terms of the Irish language and the GAA and everything you know, you've brought to East Belfast. Is that, have you struggled with the kind of political identity? You said you're British and Irish. Do you feel like there is a home for you in Northern Ireland in terms of politics? Or are you still kind of torn? No, I am. I suppose um, my own background, my, my family are communists. Um, on my father's side and on my mother's side, well, my grandmother was a Catholic who converted to Presbyterianism. So there's always been that mixture in my background. And even as a child, you know, at, at a very young age, you know, because the troubles came when I was seven, you know, you very quickly learn that your family's politics were not viewed sympathetically. And there was, a, there was always a certain amount of danger around. At 11, I, I went to live in Twinbrook because that's where my father was living at the time. And again, that was the first time I felt sort of, um, you know, people were using sectarianism against me as a Protestant. So there was always that sort of tornness, but also I recognised then that there was two narratives. There was the Boyne and the, the bands and the bonfires that I had grown up with, but there was also this other side. And as, a, as an adult, I found that very, very difficult, but it, it worked really well for me now in my job. But I think the thing, coming back to what I'd said earlier, that I really, really resent is that because I am from the unionist community, because I am a Protestant, then, you know, I listen to people like Jim Allister, Jamie Bryson, Jeffrey Donaldson, and they're telling me what I think, what my politics are, you know, what my opinion is, how I should vote, what box I should sit in, and I just say, no, that, that's not where I belong. And also, more importantly, it's not where a lot of people that, from the Protestant community that I know, they don't feel that either. And that's why things like the Alliance Party, they, they're getting a massive increase, because people are rejecting mm -hmm. the story of the DUP. And, you know, at the minute, people are listening to Doug Beatty and saying, yeah, I, li I like a wee bit of that. You know, I want something that's a bit more middle of the road. I'm tired of this never, never, no, no negativity. I don't want it. We're not buying into it. Mm -hmm. And, Gavin, do you think um, within the British establishment, was there... Um, it very much appeared to us, I don't want to talk for everybody, but it very much appeared for us during Brexit, it appeared to Irish people that, um, I think it was once commented, we seem to know a lot about you, but you don't really seem to know a lot about us. And do you feel there was very much a, a learning curve when you were in, you know, Theresa May's government? So it's, it's not as easy as green and orange in the north anymore that there are, you know, the new northern Irish people who are, I call in betweeners, you know, we're both British and Irish. Do you think there was a kind of lack of understanding about that as well? Yeah, I think, um, and I said, I said in my remarks, I think the, the issues which came to be right at the heart of the Brexit argument weren't really talked about by many people at all in the referendum campaign. I think once you'd got through the referendum campaign, there was a very rapid but steep learning curve. So, you know, I think I'd probably been in the job for two or three weeks, by which point I understood exactly that this issue and how to address it was going to be the make or break of whatever deal that Theresa came up with. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of wider Northern Irish politics, I think it's very variable. Um, you know, within my own part, one of the things that's happened over the last 10, 15 years is the Conservative Party collectively has become yes, less unionist. You know, so there are still lots of people in the Conservative Party who are very passionate unionists, and Theresa was obviously one of them. But there are others who were very happy to prioritise the kind of Brexit they wanted over what might have been a better outcome for the union, essentially. And I think across, across all parties, uh, you would, in, in one sense, Ireland, 
not very different to France or Germany, that you would get some MPs who are quite internationalist in mindset, understand the politics of neighbouring countries, are interested in them, have relations with, with parliamentary colleagues in different countries, and others who are a little bit uh, less knowledgeable. I, I would say it's very variable. Mm -hmm. And I was just actually going to ask, does anybody in the audience have a question before I go on to the next one? Oh, do you, okay. I think, yeah, do you want to stand up? Just there was a mic, but I don't think, oh, there's a mic here, hold on. Just about the legacy issue. Um, I, like my wife, Linda, would, be, um, would, have, uh, would not have ad advocated um, an amnesty for people who have done terrible things. Um, Soldier F was not celebrated on the Shankill Road. I remember two people were murdered by the parachute regiment on the Shankill Road. But there's another thing. Um, there was a deal done outside of the Good Friday Agreement when 300 people, 300 people from the Republican community, activists, received 200 on-the-run letters and 100 royal pardons. We don't know why, what they did to be pardoned. This was done outside of the Good Friday Agreement, and it stained and dispersed our judiciary, and to a certain extent, our police force. There was a leak and one person who had received an on the run letter um, came to, came to uh, a prominence. And yet no one knows, or I certainly don't know, and the media, uh, the, the, the silence of the media over that issue has been deafening. So the point is, if we're talking about legacy, let's, be, let's come across the board. We'd like to know why these people had to be pardoned. We'd like to know the people who, are, who had the on-the-run letters. Uh, should they not also go through a judicial process? Because then the game's not straight. And it led to great anger within the union, well, the loyalist community, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a big issue. Still there, still unresolved, still festering. Um, in our body politic. Thank you. Yeah, I would also um, say, like, I wasn't going to mention it, but full disclosure, so my um, uncle was murdered by Soldier F on Bloody Sunday. And I have always felt, um, and it's to this point, but I have always felt um, there's a weird type of guilt that you feel uh, being a Bloody Sunday family. So we got our inquiry. Um, and we got, you know, the millions that were spent and we got the apology and we're very lucky. I know it sounds bizarre to say that, but we are very lucky because not everybody gets that. And to that point, I have often felt that when it comes to amnesties and stuff, it's almost nearly easier to prosecute, say, the security forces because at least there might be records of where they were and what happened on the day but when it comes to victims of paramilitary violence they are kind of left at sea because very few of them get, ever get an inquest or ever get an inquiry and I think these are all the kind of threads that are going to have to be pulled out when it, it comes to analysis and it comes back to Brendan's point of why would these people come forward now you know as you say it, it supports the perpetrator Rather than and to the, that, why would those people with those on on the run letters come forward? And do you feel do you feel like the legacy? The, I know we've seen a conditional legacy now, Gavin, but do you feel like this is something we are going to see? Do you think it is possible with all the kind of opposition to it within Northern Ireland? Do you still think it's something that is going to be legislated for? It's a difficult question to answer. I mean, look. Technically, I suppose the government has, has the numbers in Parliament to try and drive through legislation. I suspect it will meet quite significant resistance in the House of Lords if they mm -hmm. did that, given the level of opposition across the political spectrum in Northern Ireland. I would certainly hope that the government will think again. Um, it doesn't seem to me to be wise to proceed in the face of such unanimity. And 
you know, I, I agree really with the point I think the gentleman was trying to make. I, the, the truth is often painful, but it's very difficult for people to move on unless they feel that an attempt has been made to get to the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously for, this issue is highly emotional in this room, but I, I had to, I was the housing minister just before the Grenfell fire. And I had to give evidence a few weeks ago to the public inquiry that was established there. And I had a role in setting it up when I was chief of staff to Theresa, and we did it because Theresa felt very strongly that the families would not be able to move on until they got an independent analysis of what happened, why it happened, and, and how, their, how their loved ones died. And I think, you know, whatever you're talking about, whether you're talking about a, a long-running conflict like this or you're talking about a disaster that happens on a, in a particular moment, it's very hard for families to move on until they feel they've got to the truth. And it's particularly painful to them when they feel the world is moving on around them, but they've not been able to. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, another point that needs yeah. to be made, sorry, is not only, you know, about amnesties, and, um, and unfortunately, Rose, I'm, I'm going to be having a go at your party here. Right. It's the fact that we have people still celebrating the violence and commemorating the violence. Now, there's no issue about people commemorating victims, commemorating you know, people who were involved. But I think when we go out of our way, especially when this influences young people, to talk about this glorious war that we had, and celebrate that violence, that they have to draw a line at that. And I just think that's whether it's coming from the nationalist community or coming from the unionist community, that is wrong, yeah. absolutely wrong. Yeah, I just want to come on, maybe just I'll let Rose just, answer. Yeah, maybe I'll just, just how answer do you, How does it yeah. sit where you can say, there's often a thing about, you know, the hunger striker Thomas McAuley, whenever there's a commemoration for him, and how do you reconcile that with, you know, peace, peace and reconciliation when, you know, there are people who have committed acts of violence and then they are being commemorated? That absolutely is a challenge and it certainly will be a challenge going forward. War should never be celebrated and the conflict shouldn't be celebrated. But people will commemorate on both sides and I think we have to find a way that people can commemorate in their narrative of the war people can commemorate without it being a celebration. It should never, ever be a celebration, ever. The loss of life should never be a celebration. Brent, do you want, do you want to take one? Yeah, Brent, uh, no, yeah. no um, just regardless of the status of the person, if they did wrong, they should pay a price. That's mm -hmm. my belief, whether they were a member of a paramilitary organisation or a member of state forces. I firmly believe that there should be equal treatment if for wrongdoing to try to get the justice and convict people if that's possible. But one other aspect uh, that I listened to last night at some stage on BBC was in the changed amnesty proposals by Mr Johnston's government. They talked about opening the British archives and having a history of the era of the Troubles. Now, that's stretching credibility altogether. Um, I stood on Talbot Street today with many hundreds of other people, along with Antisha and other public representatives of all parties, where we commemorated the awful day. It, the, this was, there were many bad days during the year of the Troubles in our island, but this was the darkest day in, in 1974 when 33 people were killed in Dublin and in my own constituency. In, and Antisha quite rightly referred, and we, we spoke earlier about the um, unilateralism by the British government in regard to the protocol. It's the same has been done in regard to legacy. The Stormont House agreement is there. That agreement, to the credit of both governments, my party was not in government at the time, and I know there are public servants here who work extremely hard to get that agreement at the time, in, in working along with the five political parties in Stormont, the Irish and British governments and parties. That agreement that is in place, that architecture is there, to deal with legacy issues, and it's victim-centered, which it should be. But to talk now about the idea of opening the British archives and, and having a history of the trouble, I'd remind Mr. Johnston that in 2008, 2011, 2016, Dáil Airden passed a unanimous motion calling on the British government to give access to an international, eminent, independent legal person to have access to the papers and files pertaining to the Dublin Monaghan bombings. Very, very regrettably, that call from a sovereign parliament on three different occasions has not been responded to by the British government. 
So the idea of opening up the archives in regard to a history, it doesn't have much credibility with me when I think of what happened in my own constituency in this city 48 years ago today, and sadly on many other occasions as well. And just on that, um, I just want to talk about the SDLP in terms of, you know, we know that um, Sinn Féin, they don't take their seats, so they run in the Westminster elections, but they don't take their seats for their own reasons, and that's fair enough. The SDLP do, um, you know, Callum and Claire, Hannah are there. Um, in terms of, you know, we're seeing Boris Johnson now on this unilateral action and Brexit, and it seems to be, you know, one thing after another, it's just, it's very disheartening to watch, I think, for everybody here, that this Conservative government kind of just rattling away, um, despite the wishes of the people in Northern Ireland. Do you see a future for, especially nationalist um, politicians, to keep returning to Westminster in this kind of, this kind of government who just unilaterally doesn't really seem to be listening to anyone else? Well, I I think that the role, and you know, you've identified Claire and Colm, there's two of them, and I think their contributions over the last number of years have been significant in holding the government, the British government, and uh, Boris Johnson's government to account. I think it's very important that they articulate the views, not just of our nationalist community. I think both Claire and Colm have demonstrated an ability to speak on behalf of people right across Northern Ireland and right across this island in Westminster. And I think that that tradition of constitutional nationalists raising their voices in Westminster remains hugely important. And even more so when you have a government that seems to disregard the views, not just of nationalists, but of many people in, in Northern Ireland and across this island. So I don't see any change to that. In fact, I think that there's a very important role for um, the SDLP to play in, in that regard and I hope in, in a number of years we'll see more SDLP uh, MPs returned to Westminster to continue that. If I could just pick up though on two things that, that, that sort of come out of the conversation a moment ago and I think it's timely and it's important when we're at an event to celebrate the amazing work that Glenn Cree does. One of the, the words that has kept popping up as I've been saying here this evening is the word reconciliation. And it is a word that we often use, that we often throw out. Um, but having had the privilege of running for election over the last six months and being out meeting people, one of the big epiphanies that I had was that I feel that the reconciliation process in Northern Ireland and on this island and on these islands has disappeared somewhat. Mm -hmm. I really didn't feel a sense, and, and my own party, we have to take responsibility for this too. Where is the reconciliation process? Where is the conversations happening in communities, in civic groups, in business groups, in political parties to ask what we can be doing to build a truly reconciled society? So actually, I think there is a huge piece of work to be done to bring back and to reimagine the possibility of a reconciliation process. And it's why the work that Ben Cree does, and, and I commend you for it, is so important. And of course, if you have a real reconciliation process and you're committed to that, at the heart of reconciliation is truth. And therefore, acknowledging truth and putting truth at the heart and acknowledgement at the heart of reconciliation helps you to get to that place. And to follow on from something Linda said, I, I completely agree. I think Linda is one of the, the, the shining lights uh, from our society in Northern Ireland. And what she talked about a moment ago is something I feel very deeply about, which is our young people, our future in Northern Ireland and on, the, on these islands. And we must not let the politics of the past, the failure of uh, politicians to address a reconciliation process, to blight their future. Uh, we must put the focus on building a better future for them. And it is where um, we have a huge piece of work to do to show them that, that the, the politics of the past, conflict, those who got involved in conflict, that is not the way of the future. Um, we have a poverty of ambition in many places in Northern Ireland. And that is something, again, that I think a reconciliation process has to address, which is to eradicate that poverty of ambition. Mm -hmm. um,
questions. Do you want to stand up? There's a okay. Thank you. Um, sorry, I have difficulty remembering exact forms of names. So it's Lord Barwell. You mentioned the very interesting point about Britishness and Irishness. Now, I raised that with the British ambassador, oh, 10 years or 15 years ago, because the British Council did a very good document on that, or a sort of launched a, a project on that some time ago, about 10 or 15 years ago. And he agreed with me at the time, now it might sound obvious now, that people who are not English and white tended to call themselves British in, in Britain. And that's one of the things I think we need a word in Ireland that is not just Irish, I think, to include people nowadays who are black and brown and Muslim and all the rest of it, plus the fact people who are from Northern Ireland or who are unionist or whatever you want to call it. There needs to be another word because Irishness has been spoilt, in my view, by the Republican point of view, but however, it has been taken over as one meaning if we're all Irish and it's presumed. It was a stupid research done over the last week or two. And it said how many people, and it was in the Republic, if I remember correctly, want, would vote for a united Ireland if a vote was held soon. <clears throat> and I don't know, 50% stupidly said, Yes, but to what? Are they stupid or what? Why? I mean, have, surely we have to have conditions. So that's the first point. Britishness and Irishness, we need something like Britishness to cover various forms of Irishness. And the second point I'd like to ask our Sinn Féin, please tell me why you will not accept things by treaty such as the name of Northern Ireland. You refer to the north of Ireland, six counties even, which drives me mad. Why can't you call it what is legally internationally called, and if you're in government, surely you'll have to call it Northern Ireland. I'd love an answer to that specifically, please. Okay, well maybe mine will be shorter, so I have no problem whatsoever in calling it, or people calling it whatever they want, and you'll see in Michelle O'Neill's uh, uh, speech last week, um, she referred to Northern Ireland as well. I have absolutely no hang-ups whatsoever around it, so it's, it certainly is, it isn't an issue for me. No, it's, well, it's not an issue. Obviously, the, uh, the, the First Minister in, in waiting, if it ever happens, referred to Northern Ireland last week as well. I think if it's important for somebody else, for her to say that, to be inclusive, then she did that as well. I, I'm not sure if you heard her say that. In Stormont? Can I? Can well, I think, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I can only speak for the here and the here and now. I don't. Okay. Uh, you know, well, you know, in the same way that you, you cannot understand and think people are, are, are stupid because they'd vote for a United Ireland. I, I cannot agree with you. But that's democracy. Exactly. People will decide for their own reasons. I try reasons. and come back to you. To you. I mean, look, one of the observations I, I would make, it's not really my business, but my experience was on, on all sides, there were kind of long-standing issues about how you referred to things. So I can remember when Arlene objected to the, the first draft of the, um, the joint report, one of the amendments they made was changing Good Friday Agreement to Good Friday Belfast Agreement. You know, mm -hmm. so names are important to people. And it, you know, I can, I can completely understand where you're coming from, but I can understand the opposite. Yeah, I just wanted to say, even from my own point of view, I flip between the North, Northern Ireland. It's, it's just something I've always done. It's not even who I'm talking to at the time. It's just I would flip between the North and Northern Ireland. But um, people on social media seem to have a real issue with it. <laughs> so I... on, your, on your the question you addressed <laughs> to me, um, no, I, I don't think it's for me to, to speak to what the right language for Ireland is, but it's an interesting question in terms of Britishness. So what, what you said is definitely how people used to feel. And I, I gave you the example of my friend, same age as me, and how he feels about it. There's a little bit of a sign of an attempt now to claim Englishness as an identity that is not just an ethnic identity. Um, I think it's a sort of pushback against the far right um, the success of the English football team has been a factor in it. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so these questions are complicated. And one of the things I would say is they're not, they're not ultimately resolvable top-down by politicians deciding what, the, yeah. what people should call themselves. Or how, people decide for themselves what their identity is and what they think about mm -hmm. it. So I think there is an increasing 
it's definitely true historically that a lot of people from ethnic minority communities in the UK would have thought of themselves as British first. But that is changing, I think. And there's an increasingly assertiveness among them to say, I am black English or I am English Indian or whatever. So I think these are, these are things ultimately we have to let people decide for themselves, how they mm -hmm. feel in their hearts, what their identity is, and, and be respectful of those choices. Um, Connor, you wanted to come Yeah, on? I think you have made a very important point in his remarks tonight about the rejection of the binary. And I think when it comes to identity, what we're seeing more and more is people are rejecting binary notions. Um, it is possible, um, you know, and, and again, as someone who uh, recently entered uh, politics and became a nationalist, it was very interesting to see how people reacted to that label, even though I have many other identities that would describe me. In fact, uh, one day I said, you know, uh, there was a Britishness to my Irish identity, and it created this whole storm on Twitter that somebody, I was a traitor to Ireland, <laughs> I was to, you know, I was a castle cat, I was all the things you can imagine <laughs> that were said about me. And, 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 and this is a reaction by people who see still uh, identity as binary, but I think more and more people are now seeing identity as something which is fluid, which can evolve, um, and which can engage many people. I mean, one of the, the stories I often tell is that uh, about seven years ago, I was asked to lead a UK delegation to a forum in Japan. And I was the first person from Northern Ireland to lead that delegation. I was very proud to do so, a delegation of 10 people from across the UK. And for me, it was very, I was very proud to be Irish leading a UK delegation. And to me, it epitomized the possibility of what it means to be Irish, British, or both, what it means, the totality of relationships between this island. I could still be Irish, but I could represent the UK at this forum. And I think this is the kind of thing we need to get back to. And to your challenge, I think actually I, I, I believe that Irishness does and can continue to include that range of new, of, of new identities or, or new expressions that, that you articulated. I think okay. it comes from people. Are sorry, Eva, if you're ready, just ladies been waiting. If you don't oh, mind. Okay, no worries. It's um, room. Yes, yes, thank you. Excuse me, I'm not that important. Um, I just want to um, go back to what Connor was saying there, and you, you, you mentioned about reconciliation and the reconciliation process, and that was one of the major things that kind of fell by the wayside from the time of the Good Friday Agreement. Obviously, the political um, stuff took up so much time and diversion, but one could argue that if the reconciliation process had been led and furthered from then on, we mightn't be where we are now. And going back to where we are now, um, today and um, you know, in relation to Liz Truss's uh, um, speech today in Parliament and all of that, what do the panel think of how the, you know, how we can get over this stumbling block now, and how we can engage with unionist concerns and their genuine concerns about the protocol? Because, as some people said, you know, that is the the, 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 the other side of the whole thing. We can't always be looking at it from the perspective of the South or from nationalism and all of that. But I think one of the great, I mean, Lord Barnwell mentioned about during the, um, uh, the, the Brexit deliberations and the debates coming up to the referendum, there was very little reference to Northern Ireland. And that was very, very true. It was very stark. But another major, major problem was the suspension of the Northern Ireland Executive and Assembly in the three years that were so crucial. And also that in Westminster, the only person standing up for the Good Friday Agreement was an independent unionist, Lady Sylvia Herman, because Sinn Féin refused to take their seats at that time when there was no forum in Northern Ireland where the voices of the people of Northern Ireland could be heard and we're going to again get into that situation so that even if the executive can't be put up and running now, which it should, but if it can't, the assembly at least should be seen as a priority, that the DUP should be persuaded in as much ways as possible. And that requires generosity, generosity from the Republican movement who are now in a moment of triumph, and from triumph should come leadership and reconciliation and generosity, great generosity now. And from us here, Going back to the whole idea of identity, that is so important because it, working in schools in Meath over many years, we found that the greatest problem with many of the students was grasping the idea that there could be a British and an Irish identity. They could grasp Romanian identities, all the other immigrant groups that were coming in in the 90s and later. They always, and to this day, there is a huge problem unless, until they engage with people from various perspectives of the unionist community. And that is our 
job to do too, to, for us to prepare properly for understanding real identities and for engaging and accepting, because it can't be all left to the people of Northern Ireland who have had to go through so much mm -hmm. in this period. And um, we're just looking forward now, how do you change the, how do we reform the Good Friday Agreement structures so that we cannot again have people holding up the whole <coughs> electors of Northern Ireland and that we can get over genuine concerns and problems like this without them being politicized and taken over. So there, there's areas of reform that we must deal with in the next six months, and hopefully the assembly will be up very shortly before the next couple of weeks, if we can at all do that, because that allows a forum for Northern Ireland elected representatives to speak and come together from all perspectives. I just want to um, put that to Rose, first of all. You know, we're hearing a lot from Sinn Féin. There's a lot of back and forth, um, I don't think there's any love lost between um, Sinn Féin and the DUP at the moment. Do you think your party is doing enough to reach out to the unionist community and their concerns around the protocol? I think we're doing everything we possibly can. I think we've made it absolutely clear and we made it clear during the election campaign that we want the assembly up and running. I think even in the last number of days uh, we have done that uh, and we'll continue to do that. But we also know, you know, you talk about the protocol, there's things, the joint committee is there. It's there for a reason. We believe that um, the, the, the problems that are there, that they're causing the, some of the unionist community in the, in the protocol um, can be solved through the joint committee. It's the only way that it can, but it cannot be scrapped. It has to be there. The mere fact that we have Brexit means that we have to have the protocol which was the protocol that was supported by the DUP. But we will continue, and we will continue in the, next, in, in the coming days to do everything that we possibly can to have the, the assembly up and running. I mean, even if we had the, the, the speaker uh, elected, then we could uh, have the committees and some work could get done. We are extremely conscious of the fact that we are in a, a crisis in terms of inflation and the cost of living. And that is really what is... is, is uh, is having a huge impact on people, and there's 300 million there, as we know, to be distributed. We know the state of the health service in the north. We know that Bengoa has to be implemented, and, and all of those things. And we are really, really serious about getting that done, and very genuine. And I would give you the assurance of that. We are very genuine in having the assembly up and, up, up and running. Uh, it's, it's the only show in town, and it is about people getting together and... Uh, it's only by dialogue that that can be solved. I don't think Boris Johnson's visit uh, yesterday helped the situation uh, any, um, but I think they could, you know, those things can be solved. But the thing like the European Court of Justice, I mean, I haven't heard any, any business people in the North, and I think you refer to it in, in your own comments, uh, Gavin, um, that that is a problem for people. So, I mean, that wasn't introduced until July, July of last year. So we are not sure what success looks like to the DUP. And that's why I think that there is a responsibility on both governments uh, as well as ourselves. And we see the, uh, the um, US administration uh, getting involved again as well. And indeed, I welcome that. I don't want to see a trade war between Britain and, and, uh, and the US. But I do think it's important that the EU stand up and that the American administration, as well as everybody else, we have to get those institutions up and running because we have to remember that it is the bottom 20% of people uh, in society in the north, in the south as well, that will suffer most because of the recession. And we have to do everything we possibly can pragmatically to mitigate against that. And, and that's the only show in town. And I just want to come to Brendan next. You know, there has been criticisms from you know, unionist politicians that the, the government and the Republic on one end of the scale sometimes they are, are making it worse and, and stoking the fire. Do you think this government especially, um, with Micheál Martin as the Taoiseach, has been doing enough to reach out to unionist and loyalist communities? Do you think that that outreach is there? I believe it is. And it's done at official level, it's done at political level. A lot of the, the, that type of work we don't hear about. That's the nature of that work and, that, and that's the genius of that work as well. Look at it. our Department of Foreign Affairs over the years, even since 1998, the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, that iconic um, agreement for our country, and the genius that Gavin mentioned in that agreement as well. Huge resources and fairness and very straightened financial circumstances in our country over a number of years. There were still huge resources put into reconciliation projects 
for by our Department of Foreign Affairs in Northern Ireland and in the Board of Counties, and that's what should have been done. I think it was back at Berkeley Heard and said in 98, um, the peace process is not just about the absence of violence. It's about ensuring that we nurture peace and that we ensure that we have reconciliation as well. But one thing, just to go back to identity there, people, you know, we, we can dwell on the negatives, but I think at always in these conversations we want to be mindful of the huge positives that have flowed from the Good Friday Agreement. You take one area where identity doesn't arise, business. Our all-Ireland economy has evolved and has grown. And I know I grew up in a border, in a border community, and I know some businesses that were, they were Protestant businesses, they were then Catholic businesses, that type of thing, that demarcation to a certain extent. And since 1998, businesses have grown into all Ireland enterprises. You know, we know major businesses that had, were only located in, in our state, businesses were only located in Northern Ireland. A lot of them now have sites, enterprise manufacturing facilities, both sides of the border. We, we often leave out of our auditing of the Good Friday Agreement the huge positives that have flowed from the all-Ireland economy. That has evolved without anybody sloganeering or waving tricolours or waving union jacks or talking um, pro-republic or pro-union. People have gone on and done the business, so they have. And I think we have to be very mindful, and that should always be a very positive message for us. And it's a message that needs to go out to our communities as well. Thankfully, there are employment. There's employment in parts of my county, in my neighbouring counties north of the border, in Fermanagh, in Tyrone and Armagh as well, where there wasn't pre-1998, thankfully, mm -hmm. despite the huge um, downturn in the world economy in the meantime. Could I just say, reference was made twice that nobody had warned prior to Brexit with the consequences for Northern Ireland. I have to say, our political system was consumed of Brexit from 2016, from, from right from the time Mr Cameron announced that there would be a referendum. Every committee of the Dáil and Janet, we had more hearings on it. I don't know how many parliamentary delegations I brought from parliaments throughout all of the member states of the European Union to my border communities when we cross the, when you travel in my constituency, when Cavan and Monaghan, you go in and out of Fermanagh four times on the one stretch of road, that type of thing. You know, there was, there was a huge effort politically mm -hmm. by all shades of political opinion within our, our, office, our parliament. But could I also say, I think it's very important to note the contribution of Tony Blair and John Major. I think it was in your city of Derry, Aoife, that both of those gentlemen, that, that those men who did so much to cr create a peaceful island in this country and to improve relations between both of our countries, they warned of the consequences of Brexit. And they think they pointed out, this would be, the, be the EU border with Britain, with Derry and Donegal. They were so right. But they weren't listened to enough, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And they were people of experience. And one thing that's not done in politics nowadays it's not done on this island anyway. I don't know if it's done anywhere else. We don't listen to people with experience. We, don't, we, type to, we try to shut out corporate knowledge and experience, so we do. To our detriment, I would argue. So, I would. so there's a lot we learn from people who have been there, done that at times. So I think it's very important in that respect. With regard to, to I think, on Taoiseach, no later than uh, day in, day out in the Dáil, other government members, members of other political parties, they talk at all times that the European Union wants to negotiate. The European Union responded to the British command paper last October. The U European Union gave the SPS paper dealing with the, um, the movement of plants and food products and that, where I think 80, at least 80% 80 of, the, of the British um, concerns would be addressed. Mm -hmm. The Brits hadn't even responded to that, I don't think. They also said there can be an easing of customs requirements. Mm -hmm. I remember, I think you were there, where, Rose, we were a Good Friday Committee from our Parliament in implementation of the Good, Committee on the Implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. We were in Belfast last November, I think it was. We met different groups, civic groups, groups from different political parties. The major concern at that time was access to medicines and medicines come to Northern Ireland. And that was a particularly difficult problem. The, our Taoiseach and government members uh, and, and our Dáil as such had stated very clearly that every effort would be made to deal with that. It has been successfully dealt with. But the EU have said that the issues that are outstanding and that are of concern to people, I speak to people from both 
communities in my neighbouring in my neighbouring counties north of the border. And I know what their concerns are, but those concerns can be addressed. But they won't be addressed by um, Foreign Secretary Truss um, issuing an ultimatum. How do you expect progress if you're threatening to rip up an international agreement? You know there's a phrase, and I wrote down something, pacta sunt servanda, treaties must be observed. You know, and if trust is absent, then nothing is possible. The, 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 Talking about unilateralism and threatening, negotiation is what will, will deal with the issues that are concerning to people and are concerning to people who are concerned in Northern Ireland about the cost of living, education, health, all of that. And we want to see the executive up and running and dealing with those day to day issues. But I have to say, the Taoiseach and members of the government have been relentless in, in pursuing all of those issues. And that has been done equally at official level as well. Um, I just want to say, um, I'm going to end on a hopeful note. Um, um, Linda, you're our beacon of hope for tonight. Uh, amid everything that's going on today and in the news and Brexit and the protocol, I think you know, the work you do is probably the best example of everything Northern Ireland can be. You know, peace and reconciliation and you know, the shared future that we're supposed to have. And I just wanted to ask, are you more hopeful? than you were, you know, through all the work that you've been doing over the last 10 years. Are you, are you hopeful for the future of Northern Ireland? I think I, I continue to be hopeful. I have seen a change in atmosphere, um, you know, since the Good Friday Agreement, since that time when, you know, you, I suppose we all felt anything was possible. And, you know, the, that, that is not there anymore. But despite all that, you know, and I look at my own work, I certainly couldn't have been doing it 20 years ago. And now I feel that, you know, through our work and other people within the, the Irish language sector, that we are ch trying and succeeding in some places to change the narrative about the language and who the language belongs to and showing that it can be a medium for reconciliation. And I feel with, um, you know, with time, you know, we, we can get to a place where, you know, people won't decide what somebody's religion or what somebody's politics is because they're an Irish speaker, but it takes a lot of hard work. And I do see, you know, we, we see it in, in the voting, the growth of the, the middle ground, even though we still have the, the kind of polarization. But I think overall, people, people want to live in peace. I mean, that, that's the bottom line. Nobody wants to go back. And I don't think there would be the support for the sort of violence that we had 40 years ago. I, I just don't think people would sign up to it anymore. I think there'd be a lot more level heads. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I am hopeful. Right, we're just going to leave it there. I want to thank um, our entire panel for giving up their evenings and thank all of you for coming out in this awful Rain and thank Glenn Cree uh, for having us. It's hope he's all had a good time. <laughs>